guy does. Uh, his name is Hubert Centers, and he's from HubertCenters.com. Um, I can't, I can't nail down one thing this guy trades because this guy trades absolutely everything. I had a conversation with him uh, over the, you know, several conversations with him over the last week, and he is, he's just one of the most amazing guys you'll meet in this space, and one of the most humble. Okay, uh, he's one of the leading active investors and professional traders in this world. His daily trading research, get this guys, is followed by over 98,000 people. 98,000 people. Um, he, he and his companies, and he also has a team there over at HuberCenters.com, which, which is pretty cool. He's been featured on everywhere, CNBC, Bloomberg, Fox Business, CNN, CBS, MarketWatch, Forbes. I, I, I got a laundry list. Just Google them, okay? And you will, you will see where this guy's been. Uh, more importantly, and this holds a lot more weight for me, he is a frequent guest speaker for many of the trading exchanges, uh, the CMA, the CME, the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, the CBOT, uh, the Chicago Board of uh, Options or Trade, ICE, Eurox, you, you name it, okay? Uh, he also holds a Series 3 and 30 license, which is really important, and he's a principal at Razor Trading Holdings. Um, he actually resides in Kentucky with Lisa, his wife of 21 years, and I tell you this because Traders are traders are people, guys. These these experts are people, and and that's important to understand too. Is they're doing it just like you to make money. Um, and he has three kids: Mackenzie, Morgan, and Mason. So I love getting a little bit personal because, you know, I'm a personal guy. But Hubert, how's it going this morning, buddy? Good, Kyle. How are you? I am fantastic. I'm on my fourth cup of coffee. I got my team here. <laughs> bought them breakfast. They're they're ready to go, man. What are you nice, What are you going nice. to be talking to us about today? All right. So first, let's everybody everybody give Kyle, Ken, and Matt a round of applause. Like if, to throw these events off are not the, to pull them off are actually kind of hard when you put a lot of guys that are trading gurus or traders or educators, depending on what what label you you give all of us. It, it's kind of hard to wrangle all of us. It's it's kind of like herding cats. Um, and then, you know, so give them a, a, a round of applause. They don't have to do this. And I was talking to Kyle the other day, and we were talking about, like, their business model and stuff. And they're like, man, we just want to get the best people in the world in here to teach people how to trade and kind of filter through the guys that don't know what they're doing. So they're doing a really good job of that. So first, you know, everybody in the chat room, give, give them a round of applause because him and his team, Kyle, Ken, and also Matt this morning did a great job. Round of applause for you guys. What I'm going to talk about today is how to risk $156.25 to potentially make a thousand. Now that's a little bit off because this is this is one trade that I've proven to work, but I'm actually in the process of testing how to how to risk 156 to make two thousand dollars. We'll talk about that in a little bit, uh, but that's what I'm going to talk about. So let's get started here. Uh, first, if you can hear my voice, just give me a visual yes, because sometimes. I will hit the wrong button on these webinar softwares and I'll mute myself on accident and I don't mean to. And if you can also see a big blue slide that says how to risk 156 with a big blue eye, do you do you see that? Okay. Now, I can't see your questions. So Huber, I'll, we got we got everybody coming in saying yes, go. yes, yes. We are good to All go, right. Man. All right, so let's 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 kick this thing off here a little bit. And uh, oddly enough, I'm not a, a morning person, so it may take me just a little bit to warm up, okay? So the first thing I have to do is I have to scare you to death. I am registered, okay, and I have to do a lot of talks for the different exchanges. And first, my responsibility to you is first to do you no harm, okay? So in order to do that, the CFTC and the NFA say that I have to scare you to death, okay, which is cool. I'm, I have no problems with that. If you trade, you are probably going to lose massive amounts of money. Does everybody understand that? If you know what you're doing, you could still lose massive amounts of money. So uh, Kyle said earlier, like, I live in Kentucky. I do. So if any of you are country music fans, if you start to trade and you don't know what you're doing, it's probably going to end up like a country uh, a country song. Your wife's going to leave you. Your kids are going to leave you. Your dog's going to hate you, and you're going to lose your truck. So does everybody understand that, you know, anything that we're talking about, you, you should consider it like hypothetical, simulated performance. Past performance is not indicative of future gain. Do we all understand that this is for big boys and big girls? you got to pull your, your big girl panties up in order to do this. What we do is because we're throwing around real money. Now, we some of us make it look a little bit easier than it actually is, and some of us, when we throw trades on, you probably can't hear the squeak in our voice because we're you know terrified we're in the trade just because we've done it so often. We're like, ah, it'll either work out or it won't. And it's a percentage, and it's an odds thing, so we just go with it. So hopefully I've done my job to uh, uh, sufficiently scare you a little bit. All right, so 
My name is Hubert Sinners. I have been in the trading industry. I've been a professional trader for the past uh, 18 to 20 years, and um, I've been in the trading education game, and I actually got into the trading education game by pure accident. But I'm known in the industry for the guy with the no BS approach to trading and investing. And sometimes that's a good thing, sometimes that's a bad thing. You're either going to like me or you're going to hate me. There's not going to be any in between. What I'm going to do is I'm not going to talk down to you. I'm going to talk to you for the next, oh, 45 to 50 minutes, and I'm going to pretend that you and I are having a drink at the bar, and you and I went to school together. You're either going to be one of my best friends or you're going to be a brother asking for financial advice. So if you're cool with me talking to you like that, we're going to get along just fine. If not, we're probably going to have issues just because I'm not one of these guys that was born with a silver spoon in my mouth, and I'm not going to pretend that I was. So um, this is going to be a little bit different, but in a good way. All right. So uh, before I get into my story, I want to let you know that you can do it. This is actually a, a series of pictures of me. I, I do it for a couple of reasons. Number one, I, I do it to give you a little bit of hope. And number two, I, I've been on a little bit of a health kick, and so I'm trying to make sure that I, I stay a little bit accountable. So this is actually Paul Abdul. And look at the look at the chins here on this guy. This is me. One, two, three. Like I got three chins here. I've actually only got about two, so I'm getting in a little bit better shape. Um, so a little bit of my background. I, I grew up in Eastern Kentucky, the coal coal mine industry of the world, and um, really grew up in a, a lower middle class upbringing. Didn't have any role models for success or anything. Uh, decided I wanted to be a veterinarian, and I, I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian because my stepdad. Well, my, actually, my, my my father got killed in a car wreck when I was five. And then my stepdad actually adopted me and my other brother, and he had every business known to man. If it had anything to do with an animal, we bred it and produced it in masses. So we would have quail, chucker, pheasants, uh, horses, ponies, goats, chickens, pigeons, everything. We'd have rabbits. And so we had a lot of veterinarians come by the farm. And I'd be like, well, the veterinarian makes a lot of money, and he's not really doing much of anything, just checking out animals, giving us some prescriptions, and turning us loose. So I decided I want to become a veterinarian. Uh, as I got up through college, my grades weren't the, gra the greatest in the world, and I actually ended up dropping out of college. Because if you want to be a veterinarian, you got to take a lot of weed-out courses. And, and the classes themselves weren't that hard. I just hated school. I don't know if any of you have been there and done that, but I mentally checked out, and I was just like, this is worthless. And um, so what I'd have to do is I'd have to do a lot of uh, apprenticeships or, in other words, volunteer time with veterinarians since my grades weren't on par. I would have to get my, my number of hours underneath my belt in order to actually get into vet school. So I would ride around different veterinarians and stuff for, you know, hours and hours and days and weeks and months, and I'd get all my, my uh, volunteer work up there so I could get good letters of recommendations. And I, and I had plenty of recommendations. I just eventually came to the realization that I didn't want to do that. So one day I'm riding around with a veterinarian. The guy's name is um, Dr. John Moran. And I notice on his thumb, on his right thumb, he's draw, driving down the road and his hand's on the steering wheel. And I'm like, hey, Doc, what happened to your thumb? He goes, oh, son, that's not a thumb. That's my big toe. And I'm like, okay, i got to hear this story. He goes, well, what happened was there was a cow in the middle of the field and she was crying, you know, Woo! He said, and I walked up to her and tried to figure out what was wrong with her. You know, we got a call. He goes, and I, I, I figured out that uh, she had an a, she had a, a apple stuck in her esophagus. I'm like, huh, well, what did you do? He goes, well, what I did is I took my, my hand and I stuck it in the cow's mouth and I stuck my arm down her throat and I grabbed the apple and pulled it back up. And he says, as I was pulling it up, she bit off my left thumb. And I'm like, well, that's retarded. Why would you put your hand out of cow's throat? I mean, it's just crazy because their stomach and their esophagus can actually harbor the rabies vir uh, virus, and I know he knows that. So, uh, so as opposed to killing the cow and cutting his cut, cutting the cow up to get his thumb, what they do is there's this procedure where they'll actually remove your big toe and plant it on your thumb, and that way you'll still have an opposable thumb. And I'm like, okay, note to self, never do that. Now I was like, what do you do the next time a cow has an apple stuck in its esophagus? He goes, well, there's one of two things that are going to happen. Either one, the cow will die, or number two, we will take the wiffle ball bat that is in the back of this truck and we'll bust it up as she stands there. I'm like, I'm going to vote for two. And so then I, I start questioning, like, this, is, this industry right here is a little risky. I, I, I like my thumbs. I don't want to lose them. So he hired another guy called Dr. Phil Sims, not, and, uh, not, not the quarterback, but uh, just another veterinarian. And then I noticed that Dr. Phil Sims also was missing a thumb, and I could tell that his thumb was his big toe. 
And I was like, all right, Doc, uh, what happened to the thumb there? I, obviously, you lost it and they amputated it and put your toe on there, but what happened? He goes, oh, I was tying up a, a, a cow to a fence post, he said, and the rope got tied around my thumb and it just zipped my thumb off. I'm like, dear Lord, I'm in the wrong business. So that's the first thing I started questioning what I wanted to do in life. And then after that, um, we were pregnancy checking about uh, about 100 head of cattle. And if, if, if you've never pregnancy checked, uh, any cattle before it's a little gra it's a it's a little graphic so you can mute your speakers right now for the next minute or so. How you do it is you put a big plastic glove on your uh, they call it a sleeve, and it's actually like a, a whole arm condom basically. And you lube it up, you stick your arm in the in the in the rear end of a cow, and then you you palpate, which is just a fa fancy word for feel. You feel around how big the calf is inside her, and it's really it's important because it has to do with milk production, and you want to make sure that the you know. They're not milking a cow that's actually, you know, in the gestation periods of its life. So in the process, I'm sitting there, and I've got my arm up a cow's rear end trying to feel around how big this calf is inside this cow. And then I'm looking at Doc, and he goes, son, why do you want to do this? And I'm like, well, you guys make all kinds of money. You you don't have any uh, bosses, and you kind of set your own hours, and you do what you want to do. And he goes, all these farmers are my bosses. He's like, I'm still paying off my student loans. And I was like, oh, I'm not doing this because you've, you, you've been out of school for more than eight years. I am, I'm out. So at that point, I decide that I'm not going to go to veterinarian school, even though I could have very easily got in with all the uh, apprenticeship and volunteer work, mediocre grades. I'd have probably had to apply the second time to get in. The first time probably wouldn't have went well. Um, usually get in on average your second or your third time. So I decide I'm going to drop out of college, and uh, I talk my wife into I sell my wife into like, okay, Lisa, if you'll work for three years and just support me for three years, I'll figure out how to make my first million dollars and you'll never have to work another day in your life. It, it took me a little bit longer than three years to make my first million, and I, I won't bore you with the details, but usually when you come from nothing and then you make a million dollars, if you go from making $20,000 to a million dollars, heads up, remember to keep a little bit of it at about basically half to pay Uncle Sam. Because if you don't, Uncle Sam's still going to want his money. And I never had any tax issues or anything. I always had to trade my way out of the hole. So in the process, I started up this little thing called uh, Ameriservice, which was a, a basically a quick lube on wheels where I would go around and change oil in vehicles. I would I would drive up to people, change oil, and then we'd leave. And I ended up building that up. And uh, there was a local trans transmission shop in the air, and he had a chain of them. And it turns out if, if you can change oil, a lot of people think you're a mechanic, and I wasn't. So what I would do is I'd just do middleman markup. I would take it to a mechanic shop. They would fix it, and then we would if they if the mechanic shop charged us 200, we'd charge the customer 400. So you know we were basically scalping goods and services on mechanic services. So I start out doing that, and one day uh, David was the guy's name. He said, "Come on back here. We'll settle up on some of these invoices you owe me for." He said, and I'm trading, we'll have lunch. And I'm like, all right, what are you trading? I walk around the corner, and he's got these two giant 21-inch cathode ray tubes. Anybody remember those, those big heaters? That you, I mean, we were surrounded by them back in the day, and they were just they were just like small heaters in a room, and you'd just be sweating like you worked in a sweatshop. Um, so I, I sit there and watch him trade, and he's got the bid, the ask, the lass, and the net of about 400 equities that he's watching just blink on a screen. I'm like, well, that's kind of interesting. What's he doing here? I sit down. We have lunch, and I watch him make like $32,000 in like 18 minutes. I was hooked. I'm like, how did you do that? And he goes, well, I just saw this, and then I saw that, and then I could see that that one was moving, so I bought that one. This one over here, it was going lower, so I shorted that. And I'm like, all right, what, what, what time is lunch tomorrow? Can I come back? And he's like, lunch is the exact same time every day. You're more than welcome to come by anytime you want. And um, so, uh, long story short, I ended up coming and sitting next to the guy for about two or three weeks before he looks at me and goes, son, I guess we're going to have to get you a chair. I'm like, I'm going to need a chair, a desk, a computer, and, and, and everything, and I'm good to go. So he was, in a, he was actually uh, running a little mini hedge fund out of uh, his uh, business, and a lot of people thought he was running drugs because he was making so much money. And he'd have some really, uh, really wealthy people come in, throw some money at him. He would manage it, and he'd get a percentage of the return. It got to be such a problem that I would start managing some of his client money too. He'd be on the road, and he'd be like, "All right, wh where are the accounts at?" And I'd be like, "Accounts are doing good. I'm up eighty thousand dollars on the accounts. I've made us eighty thousand dollars." And he's like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, whoa. You, you, you messed up there. You said you made us eighty thousand dollars." I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, I made us eighty thousand dollars while you're off on your hunting trip. I'm doing just fine." 
He's like, no, 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 you don't get any of that cash. You're working for free. You know you get none of that, right? And he wasn't doing it to be harsh. He was just trying to do it to kick me out of the nest and go, look, dude, you know what you're doing. Why don't you scrape up some money and start trading your own account? So that's what I did. I ended up uh, borrowing about $5,000 from relatives. And on my first trade, my very first trade, it works like this. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to round off the numbers because it makes the, the story a little bit easier to tell. So my first $5,000, I end up getting in a trade, and I basically – I basically double it, okay? So I go from five to ten, all right? And then and then I do another trade and I go from ten to about twenty. Okay. So I'm sitting there going, this is it. I am the man. I can do no wrong. I have I've been training under this guy for two years. I've earned my I've earned my chops. I know what I'm doing. I got this. I I, I got this. So the very next trade, I go into a trade, and this is my entry right here. That's my entry. And then the then the, immediately the stock drops. Okay, the stock drops. And then here's my stop loss. All right. And then can anybody guess what happened once it started getting to my stop loss? You're probably going to guess. As soon as it came to my stop loss, I move my stop loss from here down to here. And at this point, then I start feeling a cold sweat come on to me, and I'm like, Oh my God, what am I doing? Why did I move the stop? And then it comes down again to this stop, and I'm like, No, 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 I can't afford that loss. And then I move the stop loss one more time. At this point, I've taken twenty thousand dollars and I've wiped it out to about seven thousand dollars. I'm nauseous. I feel a cold sweat. I know I'm going to throw up. So I rush to the bathroom. I lose my lunch in the bathroom, and as I'm wiping the throw up from my face, my trading mentor comes in and goes, "What's wrong, Susie? You having a bad day?" And I'm like, "God, yes. I just got annihilated. I mean, I'm just. I don't even know if I can do this." And and he, all he did was like, you need to cowboy up, get back in there and make the money back. You know what you're doing. Don't ever move your stop again. Okay, he said, you now just learned a very expensive lesson, he said. And you have to learn it with real money. You can't just learn it with somebody else's money, and you can't learn it on a demo account. He said, so get back in there, make it back, and you'll be fine. So I tell you that story to tell you another story. So then what we did is we took a 25000 co-managed account, me and him together, and in a little less than 18 months, we managed to grow it from $25,000 to $868,000 before we started taking our first 25% drawdown, okay? And then I learned, actually, like, I actually learned more when I was taking my drawdowns than I was when I was actually making the 25 up to almost a million dollars. So, and I'm going to share some of those things with you today. Now, I've already tried to scare you a little bit and tell you that this is hard and not a lot of us can do this because it's a real hard business. But I'm a huge believer that if you can find somebody that's doing what you want to do and they're actually good at it and they can actually teach you, then you will probably have a, a, a level of success close to theirs. So I have had enough business and trading success that I can actually afford if I want to travel around and meet famous people like Paul Abdul where I, we advise her on her finances and her business. You know, I help Richard Branson out with his charity uh, foundation and raise money for some of the things that he's doing now. Right now, I'm in my home office. So my, my house, my my home office at my house is about 1,500 square feet. I call it the Bat Cave because it has secret bookcase doors in order to let me come in, and it also and it's kind of soundproof. It's kind of weird, right? So I sound like a little bit of a hermit because I probably am. Like I'm not the most extroverted guy in the world. I'm more introverted unless I'm talking about business or trading, okay? And I get real jacked up about those two because I love those two things. So as I'm talking to you today, this is where I'm at right now. These are six 24-inch LCDs. This is the microphone that I'm talking on. I am not wearing a suit and tie right now. I've got a fleece shirt on and a, a pair of fleece uh, sweatpants and, and, and a pair of socks. So it's Saturday. I'm chilling. Um, but this is kind of how I spend my life is down here in the, in, in the, in the secret headquarters uh, and that's what I do, and if I wanted to, I could travel around and stuff. I just, I just choose not to, cause I, I prefer to spend way more time with my my family, my wife, my kids, and my 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 extended family and my friends and my business associates. So, I'm not saying that you can't do it. If you want to, I've done some of this stuff in the past. What I've found that I get more jacked up spending time with people that I actually care about than I do people that you know I could do other things with. So the good news is, is you're at the right place at the right time, and here's why. Let's do some quick math really quick because one of the things that I'll get asked at uh, seminars for the CME, the Chicago Board of Trade, Money Show, or any of the webinars I do is like, 
and this is the number one question, and you should never ask this. If you ever ask this question, you don't really know how to trade. So what you want to do, because this is like a newbie question, okay? So if you're ever at a webinar, if you're ever in front of another trading guru, I guess is what they call us. It's kind of weird. I don't like the, the, the title. I'm just like you. I put on my pants the exact same way you do, one leg at a time. There's nothing that I do that is anything special. Only thing is I've probably been bashed in the face and the nose a few a few thousand more times than you have, so I've just got some experience. So try to never ask this question because what it is is it's an amateur question. What is the percentage of success rate of this trade? All right. Now, I'm not saying it's a crazy question. It's an interesting question, but what it does is it shows you that you're an amateur, all right? And you don't want to be amateurs. What you guys want to do is I assume that you guys want to go pro, right? So in the process of going pro, a lot of my trade setups and a lot of the traders that I know are nowhere near 50%. And now you're going to go like, oh, dear Lord, how am I going to make money if I'm not 50%? Most of my trades work about 38 to 42% of the time. Now you're going to go like, oh, you make no money. No, no, no. Hold on just a second. So for real traders that really trade, what we'll do is we'll risk a very small amount of money in order to make a very large amount of money. So the percentage doesn't really matter to us. What you have to ask yourself is, does this trade make money for you? Because the trade that I'm going to show you, we're going to do some really quick math. Let's do this. Now, I'm dyslexic, which means I switch numbers and letters around, okay? So I'm going to need your help with some math. So let's do this. It, it, let's pretend that this trade only works 41.3% of the time, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to pretend we've got a string of 10 trades, all right? So on, on 10 trades, we're going to have six losers. On these six losers, we're going to risk $156, which is going to come to $936. That's a loss, all right? That's a loss of $936. Now, out of those six trades, or out of those ten trades, we're going to have four winners. Only four winners, so four out of ten. But our target is going to be set to a thousand. So even in Kentucky, folks, four times a thousand is four thousand. Now, if you take four thousand and you subtract nine hundred and thirty-six, so if you go four thousand and you go minus nine thirty-six, it should come out to three zero uh, six four. That should be the number. All right. Uh, that's what I've got anyway. If the math is off a little bit, don't worry about it. You can do it on your own time. But it should be pretty accurate. Now, let's say it's worse than that, okay? Let's say it only works three out of ten times, which means you're going to have seven losing trades times $156, which means you're going to lose $936. Actually, that's a, that's the that's the wrong math right there. So let me actually uh, let me see here. I've got my iPhone right here. I can do it real quick. So let's slide it here. Okay, uh, okay, and then I'm going to look at the calculator, and now I'm going to go 156 times um, 7 equals, oh, here we go. All right, so what this is going to be is this is going to be 1,092, so that number is wrong. So now we know we've got that number. Now we're, going to only, we're only going to have three winning trades, so we're going to go 3,000 minus 1092. So I'm going to do it right here on my on my iPhone, 3,000 minus 1092. So we're looking at only making out of these 10 trades about eight, about $1,900. Okay. So, and um, actually, what did I do? Math wrong? Yeah. Yeah, I did the math wrong here. So that this is the right number right here, 1908, 1908. So not bad on a trade setup that's only going to work three times out of 10. So if you look at that and you go, yeah, but the success rate kind of sucks. You, yeah. The question you got to ask is, do you hate money or not? Okay, so when you look at that, the percentage win rate, and the, you're going to have some people that tell you like, well, this trade works 89% uh, of the time. If you ever hear that, put your hand on your wallet and walk out of the run, or walk out of the room, or run out of the room. Nobody has stuff that works like this consistently, consistently, day in, day out, year in, year out, week in, week out. Paul Tudor Jones. Junior, which is one of the best traders in the world ever, is only right about 55% of the time. So what makes you think that you're going to be able to pull off a trade that is going to consistently make money 89% of the time? If I had a trade setup that worked 89% of the time, 
I would own my own private island somewhere, and I wouldn't be on webinars, right? Did everybody understand? All right. It's a numbers game, so you have to treat it like it is. All right, so let's go through. Now, I can't see your chat, all right, because I'm set up as a presenter instead of an organizer, but let me, let me tell you the five stages of trading and the stages that you're probably going to go through, and let me know what stages you are in at. So the first stage is you learn how to lose massive amounts of money. Anybody there? I know I've been there and done that. You're going to learn how to use lose massive amounts of money. And then after that stage, then you're going to learn how to lose little amounts of money. So basically what you're going to do is you're going to learn how to lose a pile of cash, and then you're going to learn how to lose a smaller pile of cash. And that's stage two. Then stage three is where you learn how to either make a little bit of money and then lose a little bit of money, or you'll make a huge amount of money and then lose a huge amount of money. That's when you start treading water. And most people get stuck in stage three. And then at stage four, you'll you'll learn how to consistently you learn how to consistently make some money. So you'll, you'll your P and L start looking like this, you know, and you'll 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 learn how to consistently make some cash flow. Now this is asterisk because I'm registered and I can't say you know. I can't make claims, and I'm not going to because, number one, I have to be able to sleep at night, and I, I just don't talk about stuff like that. But at stage five, you're, you're going to be able to make a consistent killing. In other words, I don't know what a killing is to you. Maybe it's 200 a month. Maybe it's 2,000 a month. Maybe it's 20,000 a month. I don't know. Maybe it's 200,000 a month. I just don't know what a killing is to you. So after that, you, ha you will have arrived, but heads up, as a trader, you never arrive you're almost always learning or tweaking or trying to improve right? because if you're not growing you're, if you're not growing and going forward you're falling back and you're not so my question to you is what stage are you currently in are you in stage one stage two stage three stage four or stage five and you can just put it in the chat and I from doing enough of these webinars I'm sure that most of you are threes all right most of you so this is kind of what this is gauged to towards this this presentation is. All right, now now you have to figure out what style you are. So do you are you like this? Do you have big losses, and then do you have a little gain, little gain, little gain, little gain, little gain, and then a big old loss, and then a little gain, little gain, little gain, little gain, and then another big loss. That's style A, or are you style B? This is the style that I always try to stick to myself, where you have um, a big, a big, a big gain in a series, and I do mean a series. I mean I'll have a lot of them in a row, lots of little losses, and then boom, a big gain, and then another huge series of little losses. Okay, and then boom, another big gain. So that's how I trade right there. That's that's why I don't care if it's only you know thirty to you know I should say thirty eight to forty two percent is my average trade. Now. What style are you? Are you A, B, or C? And hopefully you don't suffer from this where you have huge losses and then little losses and then huge losses followed by little losses. That's painful, and you need to stop that if you can at all possible. So if you are suffering from C, you're probably like this little guy. You're probably just in a, 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 a constant uh, panic mode just going, ah, this is so hard. Why is it so hard? Right? So let's go through. So which which stage are you? Are you stage or, or which style? So we've probably we've, we've we've figured out that you're probably a stage three, right? Most all right. So Market Five is telling me that most are in stage three in this webinar today. That's awesome. So that means that means that the, I don't have to change the webinar material any. So that's good. So now which stage which style are you? And Market Five guys will tell me because they're actually uh, taking a look at the chat and they can tell me are you are you style A B or C, a split right down the middle between A and B. All right, cool. That's good. That means that means we only one C. That is awesome. So that means you don't have you only have one guy that's thinking about you know. Okay, why am I doing this? All right. So oddly enough, you can actually you can actually fix A pretty easy. Okay, you can fix A pretty easy. All you have to do is just switch it around. The only problem is. Do you know why this happens? Is when you have a big old loss. Do you know why you take a profit too quickly? The reason you do it is because you have the residue, you have the mental memory of this big loss, and then what you do is you go, "Oh my God, on my last trade, I lost a lot of money. If I don't take this profit right now, I may not have the profit." So what you do is you end up, 
it's kind of weird. It's in like you, you're eating like you're eating like a uh, eating like a bird and crapping like an elephant. Like uh, you're just doing the exact opposite of what you should do. And the reason it is is because it's you're just a bundle of nerves, and you're like, oh my god, take the profit. Oh my god, take the profit. When you should be going, oh, it's a profit. Let it let it percolate, let it simmer, let it boil. Okay. So, and then as soon as the loss comes, you'll be like, oh, it'll turn around, right? So that's why A is pretty easy to fix. All you have to do is risk a little to make a lot. And that's what we're going to talk about today, and hopefully it'll fix a lot of you that are stuck on A. So I'll tell you a quick story about the pot roasts, all right? Now you're sitting there going, this guy has lost his mind. He's talked about sticking his arm up cow's rims. He's talked about people losing their thumbs and putting their toes on their thumbs. And now he's telling us a story about a pot roast. Is he ever going to teach us anything about trading? I am. And, though, and as soon as I get done with this pot roast story, I'm going to show you how to pick the best market for you to trade right now. And I'm actually going to teach you two trade setups that I use that are two of my favorite trade setups. And you're really going to get a lot out of this. And I'm not going to hold anything back. I'm going to show you the, the, the specific example, the entry criteria, and the exit criteria. So you'll be able to at least trade this market and do it with some confidence and you'll know two of my favorite trades in this particular market that I'm going to talk about. So let's talk about pot roast really quickly. I know it's a little early for thinking about supper or dinner or whatever you call it. So I'm going to use my wife's name because it's easier for the parable. So my wife's name is Lisa and I, one of my team, one of the people on my team, her name is Kelly. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about these two ladies. So Lisa's fixing dinner, and Kelly's helping her, and as uh, Kelly is watching Lisa fix dinner, she goes, okay, Lisa, I don't understand. Why did you cut the end off of this pot roast? And she goes, oh, well, that's how my mom taught me how to make pot roast. You take a pot roast, uh, you use uh, carrots and potato, oregano, salt, pepper, thyme, and, you, and then you put that in there, and you cut the ends off the pot roast, like this right here, cut the ends off. And you put it in the pan, and then you put the pan in the oven. And Kelly goes, "That's just weird. What does it make it more moist? Or I mean, what's the, what's the purpose?" And she goes, "Oh, I don't know. That's just how my mom taught me how to do it." So Lisa goes to her mom, and then they go to uh, Lisa's mom, or or Jules' mom. So now they're at their grandmother's, and they go, "Hey, grandma, how, what what's the deal with the pot roast? Why why do we do what we do?" And they go, "Oh, well, let me go through the recipe. The recipe is go get a pot roast. Uh, you're going to use carrots and potatoes, uh, garlic." salt and pepper, seasoning, and oh yeah, and right before you put it in the pan, you're going to cut the ends off of the pot roast, put the pot roast into the pan, they're like, whoa, 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 that's the part we don't understand, why do we do that? And they're like, oh, well back in the day, honey, uh, we didn't have enough money for a bigger pan, and the pot roast was always bigger than the pan, so in order to make the pot roast fit into the pan, I would just cut the ends off of it. So you have to ask yourself, like, have you ever been told a story like that in trading where it's passed down from generation to generation where it just makes no sense at all of what you're doing but people just told you that and you're like oh okay well I'll just do that and you just believe them so so we're going to talk about what is the best market for you to trade and the best market for you to trade may be different from the best market for other people on this webinar to trade and it may not be a, a market that I would trade all right so I'm going to show you how I go about helping people find the best market for them to trade. All right. So if, if if you go out and you ask the general public, what is the best market to trade? <clears throat> Most of them will tell you like, well, if you're going to trade, you need to trade the S&P minis. It's the thickest, most widely followed market out there. You should trade that. Only problem is, uh, and they'll tell you like it's it's the biggest, most volume everyone trades it is. And you'll start trading it, and then what'll happen is you'll get chopped up, and uh, you, you trade it and you get chopped up and then you start to ask your questions like, I thought this is supposed to be the best market to trade. I thought this is supposed to be easier, not harder. So what you do is you start asking yourself, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do this? And the problem is, raise your hand. I can't see your hand, but raise your hand if you have ever experienced this in the E-minis. And the E-minis for me, when I'm talking about the E-minis, I'm talking about the ES, I'm talking about the Dow, I'm talking about the Russell, and I'm talking about the NASDAQ. Has anyone ever been chopped up in the E-minis? You probably have if you've traded them more than twice because they have a personality that goes like this. Run, stop, reverse. Run, stop, reverse. Run, stop, reverse. Run, stop, reverse. Now, 
This is not because you are stupid. It's not because you are dumb. It's not because it, it's rigged and it's, and, and it's against you. It's because this is the personality that the ES traits. What it is is it's a sprinter. And if you're a sprinter, you're not gonna, it's not going to do well with breakout strategies. So if you're trading the E-minis and you're trying to do breakout strategies, now lately they've been working pretty good, right, because the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ just continue to go up, 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 up. But as a whole, the index futures are sprinters. They run, stop, reverse, run, stop, reverse, run, stop, reverse. And about the time you think you've got it figured out, it'll break away. It'll break away, come back and get you, run, stop, reverse. So it's, it's, it's kind of famous for doing that thing, all right? So you'll start asking yourself, like, I'm smart, I'm successful, but this is just too dang hard. Why can't I do this? It's got to be rigged, right? And that's the number one thing people will think. It's not rigged. You're just trading the wrong thing. Now, you have been betrayed, but it's not your fault. You've been lied to. Now, I'm not saying that you've been betrayed, betrayed. I'm saying that people have told you an old wives' tale, like, you should trade the E-minis. Everybody that trades them, it, 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 the reason it has so much volume is because everyone trades them. So who says this type of stuff? They say, you know, who are they? They are other traders. They are the media. They're investors. And this is passed down from generation to generation. Did you test it? Or did you just start throwing money at it? Did you look at the E-minis and go, does this thing fit my personality? You know, so it's the same thing. Like, you know, you may be a BMW guy. You may be a Mercedes guy. I don't know. Maybe you're a Ferrari guy. Maybe you're a Lamborghini guy. Maybe you're a Ford guy. Maybe you're a Chevy guy. I don't know. And, you know, it just all depends, like, which, you know, I, do you like chocolate or do you like strawberry? So what you have to do is you have to, you have to lean towards a market that's going to match up with your personality really, really well. If you don't, it's going to make it really hard. So did you test it or did you just believe it? It's okay to trust everything that everybody says in webinars. There's not a problem with that. And I would say as a whole, most people are good, honest people. Now, the only problem in the trading education game, and I'm not going to tell you anything that's not that you don't already know, 75% of trading educators do not trade. They educate. All right. Only about 25% of us that actually educate still trade. All right. So you can still trust everybody that tells you anything, which I think is a good good way to live. But you want to also make sure you verify. So if I told you like, hey, use this target, use this stop, and if you just went out and did it, you know, that would be a little bit on you. All right. So you could trust me, but what I want you to do is verify all this too. And you can verify it with demo money. You could do a little back testing. Or you could throw a, a little small amounts of cash at it to see if it actually works for you. So true or false, if you can trade, you can trade any market. Do you believe that to be true? True or false, if you can trade, you should be able to trade any market. True or false, do you believe that to be true? True or false. So I would say, I would say this would be my slant on it. True but it's a lot easier to trade something that the, that matches your market trading style and personality. So I would say it is true. Like if you, if you're a real good solid trader, I would say it's actually true that if you can trade, you should be able to trade anything, but there are just some things that you're going to trade better than others because they're going to match your style and personality. So if you don't match your trading style to the right market, it's going to be very painful and very frustrating. Trading the wrong market or the wrong style for you is like hitting yourself in the head with a hammer. It's going to feel great once you stop. I'm going to read that one more time. Trading the wrong market or the wrong style for you is like hitting yourself in the head with a hammer. It's going to feel great once you stop. So now you're probably sitting there going, that's awesome. How do I do that? So think about this statement. What's wrong with getting richer quicker? And I'm not saying that by any means that you're guaranteed that you're going to make money. You're probably going to lose all your money trying to trade. But do you think it would be easier and a quicker way to learn how to trade than if you just jived with a certain market? So if I told you, like, hey, you should trade E-minis. They're, they're going to do real well for you because that's your personality. Oh, you should trade corn. That style, your personality is going to work really good in corn. Oh, you should trade currency futures because they 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 link up with you really good. Oh, you, you should stay in the stocks and buy and hold because you don't have – the risk mentality to kind of go in and out on stuff. So what's wrong with doing it a little bit easier? All right. So this is the way I teach people how to pick markets that are going to match 
your your personality the best. The first thing for most people, this is going to be true for most people. I'm going to say it's going to be true probably for 70, 80 percent of the people out there. On an, on an average true range, does everybody know what an average true range? All it is is the average movement that something's going to have in a in a given day. So on the Dow, it's going to move 93 points. It's going to it's going to make you five bucks per point. So you're going to make or lose 465 dollars a day. All right. So these four right here, the Dow, S S P, Nasdaq, and Russell, they're going to go like this: run, stop, reverse, run, stop, reverse, run, stop, reverse. In the process. S and P is going to move 10 points. The Nasdaq is going to move 25, and the Russell is going to move about 10. So these are going to be your plus or minus numbers on the day, plus or minus. If you caught the entire move, but you will never catch the entire move. Okay, so don't try to catch bottoms and buy tops or buy bottoms and sell tops. It's 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 almost impossible. You can do it every now and then, but you can't do it consistently. So by far, the Russell here is going to be a little bit better, but it's also the thinly the thinnest traded one, and it's a little bit crazy because it's 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 even more herky jerky. Now the bond market, it's going to move about a point and 1.15. It's worth a thousand dollars a point, so you're going to make or lose 11.50 on a day. The cool thing about this, and this is the market we're going to talk about, is the bond market. Is it goes like this? It goes up, 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 pull back, up, 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 pull back, up, 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 pull back, up, up, up. So it's real trending in nature. So the best markets to trade on this board would be the 30-year bond or the 10-year note and or gold, okay? Because the reason is, is they trend really, really well. They are not sprinters. They're marathon runners. They go and go and go and go, and then they pause, do a little pullback. Then they go and go and go and go. Then they pause, do a little pullback, and then they continue. They're kind of like the Energizer Bunny, okay? So when you're looking at that stuff, you may be saying, well, yeah, but Hubert, there's there's some really good trades here, like crude oil, almost two points. It's going to make 1830. Crude oil is crazy. Unless you're a professional, this is a widow maker. It's going. It's this thing right here is bipolar. Okay, bipolar. Leave it alone. Bipolar will hurt you. Silver, awesome, five dollars a point. Call it the widow maker because it'll it'll gut your account in about two seconds if you don't know what you're doing. Gold, on the other hall, other hand, pretty good. Moves about 18 points. It's going to make or break you. 1840. So what we're going to focus on is the 30-year bond today. Also, currency futures. If you trade the E-minis, if you just move from the E-minis down to the, either the Aussie dollar or the Euro, you're going to be a lot happier because it's not as choppy. So does that make sense why we're doing what we're doing? So first, it's the average range of the the wideness of that market. So best analogy I could give you is this would be a, an airstrip and this would be an airstrip. Which airstrip would you rather land on? The small one where you have a very small margin of error or the large one. Most people would prefer to land on the one that's going to give them the, a larger margin of error. So why to trade bonds and notes? Because you're going to be able to hold a winner longer. Uh, on E-minis, they're going to go run, stop, reverse, run, stop, reverse, run, stop, reverse. And then on uh, bonds, they're going to go up, 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 consolidate, up, 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 consolidate. They'll also do this, down, 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 consolidate, down, 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 consolidate. They trend really, really well. All right, so we've talked about that. Now, you may not know anything about bonds, so I'm going to give you a bond trading 101 really core, really quick. i got 15 minutes to do this, all right? So I'm going to skip some slides for the sake of time. So bond trading basics, we're going to go through the months, the time, the caution, the symbols, the tick values, and the dome. So who in here, what, what do you guys trade in this webinar? Do you guys trade more stocks, options, futures, Forex? And so let's figure out that first. And then... You probably have never traded a bond because you're probably scared of it, but just because, and your fear usually comes from uh, lack of knowledge. Just because you've never traded it. Uh, crude stocks, futures, all right, so lots, lots, of that. Uh, lots of futures and options. All right, so, if, so I'm going to give you a basic bond trading 101. All a bond market is, a bond or the note market, is it's just a futures market. That's all it is. It's not something that your grandma holds on to like a, like a, like a CD or a bond, right? It's just a futures contract. So let's go through the basics here. And then I'll teach you my two trade setups that I like to use in bonds. The months of the futures, I have no idea who made up these crazy analogies right here. January, F, G, H, J, K, I don't know who came up with it. Whoever needs to be beaten, whoever came up with this strategy right here. January is F, February is G. The really only thing you really need to know is this right here. 
this is the important piece. What you want to know is that right here for bonds, H, you're going to trade March, June, SEP, and DEC. If you've never traded futures, how it works, in the second week in March, we start trading the June contract. In the second week in June, then we're going to stay. We're going to start trading June. We're going to trade June all the way until the second week in September. The second week in the in September. So now we're going to start all trading December contract. Okay. So if you've never traded futures, that's how that works. All right. So the months of the bonds I've already said are uh, March, June, seventies. This is how they work. How they work is this right here. The bond market opens up at 6 p.m. at night and closes the next day at 5 p.m. So they're open 23 hours. The open outcry, which is that pit where all those dinosaurs are standing right now, it opens up at 8.20 and closes at 3 at three o'clock. But this is where a lot of paper do, does a lot of their orders for a little bit uh, of, of a hedge. So 6 p.m. to 5 p.m. is the electronic market. The pit traded session is from 8.20 to 3 o'clock. This is how it works. This is the 30-year. This is the 10-year. These are the two best ones to trade, in my opinion. How it works is it's $1,000 a point. It moves in 31 30 seconds, so 30 seconds. So it'll be one thirty-second of a tick, or one tick is one thirty-second. It's going to make or lose you $31.25. So you got to uh, pay attention to the interest rates. Any other market and economic news releases, I use a con a day for that, like you just saw when the, the Fed decided they weren't going to taper. The bond market jumped up two points. That's two thousand dollars a contract. So let's go through. This is all. This is one slide. So a thirty-year bond, every tick is worth thirty-one dollars and twenty-five cents. There's going to be one slide that I'm going to skip to. This is what the symbols look like. So if you're going to use them in different uh, platforms, so on. This should be Z's. Let's erase this. So if you're taking notes, this will be uh, for TradeStation. It's US. It's US. US HM13. So the contract that you should be trading right now is USZ13. Okay. If you use Infinity, it's going to be ZB, uh, and then it's going to be uh, 13. ZBZ13. For Toss, it's going to be forward slash ZB, and depending on what brokerage you use. So just call your broker. They'll help you out with the logistics of what contract. So if you've never traded bonds or if you've never traded a futures, pay attention to this screen. This is the most important screen on the entire uh, presentation. If you miss this, I'm going to lose you. And I'm about to teach you the exact setup because this is we're almost at the end of Bond Trading 101 here. So let's pretend that you are long right here at 135, okay? When it goes from 135 to 135 and 132, it moves one tick. You're going to make $31.25. In order for you to make $1,000, what you have to do is you're going to go from 135 all the way up here to 135 to 136. So it's going to be 135 and 30, 30 seconds, 31, 30 seconds, and then this will be 135 and 32, 30 seconds. So that'll be 136. Has everybody got that? So every tick is worth $31.25. It's going to have to move 32 of those ticks in order for you to make your full $1,000 profit. Now, does anybody remember from the slide what was the average true range of the bond market? It was 1.15 from memory. So that should be fairly easy to do since you're going to be in it for more than 12 hours. This is what it looks like on your platform. It's going to go 131 and 31 30 second. All right, that's how some platforms uh, do it. And then other platforms, they'll do it like this, 133.12, 133.13. And all that means is 13 30 seconds or 12 30 seconds. All right, that's pretty simple. All right, uh, some things that you need to know, and then we're going to do the setup right after this. Um, intraday, intraday, you can call your broker. A lot of brokers will give you $500 intraday margin, so it doesn't require a lot of intraday. Overnight margin on a bond is $3,375. I don't recommend that you use 500-day intraday margin. So the reason that you need to know this is because if you initiate a trade at, say, 9.30 in the morning and you close it out at 4.55, you're only going to be playing, paying the intraday margin. You can also put a trade on since the market closes at, what, what time does it close? Does it close at 5 or 6? It opens up at 6, right? So you could hold, it closes at 5, 
So if you put a trade on at 9.30 and you hold it past 5 o'clock, let's say 5.30, okay, let's say, actually let's say 6.30, then that's going to cost you $3,000 to hold that thing overnight. But if you add a trade, if you initiate a trade at 6.01 p.m., it's considered an intraday trade, and you can hold that thing for 23 hours. Now you've got a decent shot of actually making some money because it, it that does depend on the broker, though. Yes, it does. All right, let's, so let's go through this setup. So this is a reversal trade. All right, we're going to talk about a reversal trade. So bonds move like this. They will go down, and then they'll go up eight ticks, and then they'll reverse to the downside. Or they'll go down, reverse 12 ticks, and then keep on trucking to the downside. Or they'll go down, retrace 16 ticks, and keep going to the downside. Okay? Got it? So this is an 8, 12, or 16 tick reversal. So what you're looking for first is you first want to figure out is the bond market in an uptrend or a downtrend on the daily. And then after it does that, then what you're going to do is you're going to go market, there's my low, let it retrace 8 ticks, and then you're going to short it. So let's get to the setup. This is what it looks like. So here's a series of trades that I did. This trade right here, I lost $156. This trade right here, I lost $156. So loser, loser. The next trade set up here, I let the market open up at 6 o'clock. I let it sell off. It puts in a bottom. I let it retrace 8 ticks, and I short it right there. I short it, and I use a 32-tick target. So I risk five ticks, which is $156, to make potentially $1,000. That's the trade setup. Let's go through the setup one more time. In this example, this is a daily chart of the bond market. It's in a massive uptrend, but the trend line was broken, so now we're in a massive downtrend. So what I want to do is I want to short any bounce that bounces up at either eight ticks, 12 ticks, or 16 ticks. And what I do is... I do the 8 tick and the 16 tick. I don't usually mess with the 12 tick, but it is valid if you want to do it. So here's this example one more time. You have a sell-off. We know that the bond market is in a, down, a daily downtrend. It sells off during the day. It opens up at 6 o'clock. I let it sell off. This is the low. I let it bounce up 8 ticks. I short it right here, and then boom, my target's $1,000 or 32 ticks. So here's where we're risking 156 to potentially make $1,000. This trade only works about 38 to 42% of the time. We've already done the math. You know how powerful it is. Here's the example again. This is the actual order you can see. There's the short. This was the bottom. I'll let it bounce up eight ticks. 146 and 4.30 seconds to 146 and eight, or 146 and 12.30 seconds. That's eight ticks. So I'll let, it, I'll let the market bounce for me eight ticks. I short it, place a five tick stop loss right here, and then I place a 32 tick target. Now, this is that trade. And you can see here's my, there's my target. It's about to be hit. And I was just trailing my stop down right here. That's it. That's, that's the first trade I want to share with you. Now, I've got seven minutes to show you the second one, all right? And you, I, know, I know they're recording this, so you guys will be fine. This is called the sneak attack trade, all right? Here are the rules for the sneak attack trade. What you're going to do from 720 to 820, you're going to calculate the low and you're going to calculate the high. If it's 17 ticks or less, you can do the trade. If it's 17 ticks or greater, there is no trade. You don't do it. That's your first filter. From 7.20 to 8.20, and this is uh, a.m. and it's East Coast time. A.m. East Coast time. If in that hour, if you have a 17 tick range or less, you can do this trade. If it's more, you can't do the trade. Here's how this thing works. Same thing. Are you in a daily up or down trend? You're in a massive daily up trend. It broke this trend line, so we're now in a massive daily down trend. So we're going to only do shorts. We're going to ignore all longs. Ignore longs when you're in a down trend. Here's how it works. From 720, you mark your low. From 820, you mark your highs. This, this is a high, this is a high, this is a high. Are you 17 ticks or less here? Are you 17 ticks or less? Yes. So 145 and 21, 30 seconds. Minus 145 and 31, 30 seconds is 10 ticks. We can do the trade. If you get a breakout of the high, you can go long if you want to. If you hate money, don't do it. Wait until you break the low of that initial range. You're going to short that. Your target 
is always going to be your initial range that you calculated from this first hour. So your target is going to be 10 ticks because you had a 10 tick range from 720 to 820. All right? That's how it works. I'm going to do one more example. So there's another example. Here is from 720. Here's 820. You mark your lows. You mark your highs. You, you know you're in a daily downtrend, so you want to do short breakdowns of the 30-year bond once it takes out that, that number that you initially established. So we're going to short it here. Here's our stop loss. Here's our target. You're always going to risk five ticks. So in this example, the risk to reward is not that great. It's two to one. Where on the other one, we've got it really good. It's like 10 to one. So there's my two favorite bond trades. The overnight 8, 12, and 16 tick reversal. And then also the, uh, the sneak attack bond trade. All right. Now I build indicators to make my life easier so I never have to calculate them. Uh, things that you need to make sure that you have in place, good money management, good entries, and good exits. That will co coincide where you'll make some really good confidence and profits. Now I've got a, you've got to have really good setups. If you don't have good setups, uh, you're kind of host, but a good setup is it will beat the pants off of a poorly or a non-executed setup any day. All right, so good's good enough. Don't try to filter out all the losses. You're not going to be able to do it. That's a fool's game. Enjoy the process. Work through it. You're going to have some wins and you're going to have some losses. So I've got a special offer here for you. I've got two different courses of my favorite trade setups right now that I usually sell for 197. And I also have a course on Ichimoku, which is cloud charting secrets. I normally sell each one of these for $197 apiece. Uh, but since you're uh, a member of MarketFi, I'm going to allow you to buy them at uh, two for one. It's only for the first 100 people. Uh, I actually have people here at the office. If you want to call, you can call area code 859 963 3445. The URL to order the course is hubertcenters.com forward slash best hubertcenters.com forward slash best. Now this goes through, I've already shared with you two of my favorite bond trades, but what I do in this course is I actually go through uh, all of my favorite trade setups. All right? It comes with 100% satisfaction, no questions asked guarantee. If you don't love it, I'm not going to keep your money. Uh, I always over deliver. You're, you're going to get about $1,000 worth of value out of those two courses. All right. So here's the URLs for you again. I don't want to pitch you really hard on it. Hopefully you saw some really good values in those two trade setups. And then I'm gonna we're gonna open it up here for QA. The URL is uh, hubertcenters.com forward slash best. And then also uh, you've got the uh, telephone number. You can call area code 859-963-3445. So I'll open it up to questions here because I don't want to take anybody else's time. All right, great job, Hubert. And I also dropped that link in the chat for everybody, so you can go check out Hubert Center's um, page and also his offer there. Hubert, we only have about a couple minutes here. Let me get into it. Got a lot of questions. Um, a couple of questions just about the actual asset classes. You know, what kind of asset classes can you trade this strategy on, or is it specific to only one? So this is this the the specific trade setup that I just showed you this morning is only for bonds and bonds only. So it'll work on the 30 year. It's good for the overnight bond trade and it's good for an intraday scalp trade. In the course, I cover e-mini stocks, futures. I, I cover everything in the course. What I do is I try to break down all of my favorite trade setups that I trade, and I trade anything that moves. If there was a market in Tic Tacs or toothpicks, I would trade it if I thought I could make some money on it. All right, we have a ton of questions. We'll make sure that Huber gets these and gets an answer if we don't get it here in the next uh, 90 seconds. Um, are there only two trade setups that you are teaching in, in that are included in the $97 special? No, there's actually uh, there's there's actually eight hours of instructional uh, uh, instruction. It's uh, stocks, futures, forex, swing trading, day trading, scalping. There's all kinds of different setups. I went a little bit long, guys, so I didn't do a really good job of explaining what's in the course. I'd much rather just give you the information, and then if you guys want to seek me out later, you can. It's not a big deal. Is your target always ten ticks? Uh, it's 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 the first hour's range. So if you get the first hour range, if it's 15 ticks, then the range the target would be 15 ticks. Do you ever enter the trade at market price on the retracement? Uh, yes, I will sometimes. But the bond market, you really don't need to do uh, market orders because it's so thick and it's first in first out. So I would just do, do a limit order. You can do market order instead of using a five tick stop loss. Use a six tick uh, six tick stop loss if you're going to do that. All right, Jerry, Philip, Rick, Tony. 
Uh, Rick again, Gary, Charles, Jack, Rick, everybody. We got a lot of questions coming in. Uh, we're running out of time here, so we'll make sure that Hubert actually gets all these questions and, and gets uh, answers over to you guys. But make sure, check out the link one more time. Uh, I'm dropping it in the chat. Uh, now, Hubert, how many of these did you make available? Only 100. I can only do 100 because I've actually sold both of these courses for $197. So for the first 100 people, um, I'll honor I'll honor the special deal. And you can we've got office people here. I can hear the people in the background talking. You can also call the telephone number, 859-963-3445. If we don't answer, just leave a message. We'll call you right back. Um, but, yeah, first 100 people. All right. Well, Hubert, you got over 400 comments here just in the last 10 minutes, so I'm going to guess those are going to go pretty fast. Hey, buddy, hey, I really appreciate you coming through today, spending the time on your Saturday uh, to teach us market by traders you know, how, how to you know, navigate the bond and futures market and all the other asset classes. You are a, a luminary in this industry, buddy, and I really appreciate your time today. Thank you, sir. You guys have a great time, and I will see you on the next webinar.